Thank you very much indeed, Jean, for your kind words. Excellency, Prime Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in Thailand we usually say, Sawat di krap. And that means hello, thank you, and goodbye. <laughs> All in one. And also it's a very good way of keeping our bacteria to ourselves. <laughs> All right? Now, I have been asked to talk about um, something that's close to your heart, it seems. But let me confess right from the beginning, when I was at your age, I didn't think of social enterprises, I didn't think of helping other people. It came later, uh, when I was well, almost into my 30s, that it happened. So don't feel bad if you haven't got the whole bug yet. Even I can catch it, so you'll be doing pretty well. You're way ahead of me. All right? So what I would like to talk about is this issue of what today they call social enterprise. I began working in it. I'm told that too, you, you can see it over there, right? Um, I began, and I called it business for social progress, because the term social enterprise was not even invented in those days. So this is 38 years ago. We call it business for social progress. It's a business, the whole purpose of doing the business was to generate social progress, directly or indirectly. Today, the West calls it social enterprise. So Singapore calls it also social enterprise. So I'm defeated, so let's call it social enterprise. <laughs> now, what is the purpose of social enterprise? Well, there are many, many purposes, but the most important one is, you can see, to earn money, to support the endeavors which make our society a better place. It's not enrich ourselves to buy another car, another airplane, but to find the funds to do the things we want to do which make the world a better place. So that's what it is. And my, my definition is very simple. When you do business, the profits from the business, if you're lucky to have a profit, must not be distributed to individuals or shareholders. The only thing you can do with it is to use it as reserve, business expansion, and charitable activities. That's the whole purpose. No distribution. If you say, well, we need some profits for the individual, that's really not a social enterprise. That is a business that might have a kind heart. But to me, it's not a social enterprise. A social enterprise must not distribute profits to individuals. It can pay salaries, no problems. Now, today, the activities we want to carry out are typified by all these organizations, foundations, NGOs, civil society organizations, many, many names. Now, the work of these NGOs, now, Many of you are thinking of doing a social enterprise, but prior to this, many of you would be thinking of setting up a foundation to do public good. But if you start up with a foundation, you must become a beggar first, beg for money. But by being a social enterprise first, you're starting off as a business, earn a profit, keep it as reserve, use it to expand the business, and then for the charitable activities that you want to do. So now the work of NGO civil society is unprofitable and therefore needs regular injections of cash. Now traditionally these NGOs rely on the goodwill and the generosity of others to cover their costs, the costs of these activities through the grants and donations. Looks like somebody's turned the lights on. Is that bright enough for you to see? Or was it better in the dark? Was it better in the dark or like this? That's better, yes. <laughs> However, <laughs> could we go back to where we were before? Yeah, we like to see your face too. Uh, it's okay, I'll stand afterwards. <laughs> All right, now if it doesn't get in the way of the color, that's okay, it's up to you. Now, however today, that it is very hard to continue to find the sources that you need from the foundations that give out money, the donors. Now, because our needs are growing, our costs are growing, and often we can't have enough money.
So today, what are we seeing? We're seeing unlimited demand chasing limited supply of funds from the so-called traditional donors, the foundations and, and, and international organizations on. Now, large and small organizations are equally affected. If such large companies as banks can go bankrupt, small companies can go bankrupt, and your donors can also go bankrupt. So the first thing that one needs to do is to redesign the program activities to at least include some cost recovery elements. And that's usually the first step, rather than just giving everything out free. Now, that will not be enough. And the second step is to perhaps come up with a more innovative project to the, the, the business community, the new donors. And this is often the second endeavor. However, we must warn you that this will not be enough because one day it will prove inadequate in the long run. Companies can also get sick of giving you the money, they want to do something else, or they can go bankrupt. So there we are. Don't expect to depend on somebody forever. So neither the traditional donors nor the corporations will ever give you enough money. So we need to take matters into our own, hand, our own hands, as I guess you can see from the picture. Now a more sustainable approach is what you are thinking about. And what the Singapore International Foundation is hoping that you will do part of your lives or most of your life or all of it, and that is to generate income through business activities. <coughs> Begging will not work. You cannot expect to live out the generosity of others forever. There's just no way. Nobody loves you more than your parents, and your parents can't help you forever. So no, can, no donor can do that either. So let's be realistic. Any help we get must be regarded as short term. So we need to help ourselves. How do we do that? By establishing a separate legal entity to do business, which is today called a social enterprise. Now, not every country has a legal standing, legal status. Singapore has it. Thailand doesn't have it. Most other Asian countries don't have it. So we need to get to the governments of Asia and, and obviously the ASEAN agenda ought to be one whereby all ASEAN governments begin to promote the concept of social enterprise. And it's, it's really happening in, in, in Thailand, just starting about after 40 years of trial and error. Why do we suggest this? Because the only long run, in the long run, the only road out of financial difficulty or demise is through doing business. Charity doesn't work. Praying doesn't work. Try it. You see, and some people say, oh, I pray to God. And the American dollar even has in God we trust. <laughs> uh, in Thailand, we don't have a God. Uh, we have something else. Always in Phuket. So, we're now engaged, we're seeing NGOs being engaged in business to raise funds for their charitable endeavors. But as a separate legal entity, in most countries, NGOs, foundations, associations cannot be involved in business. So you need to set a separate organization to do it and pay tax because there are no laws promoting or allowing social enterprises where tax are not collected. So in the beginning, in the last 38 years we've been doing it, we pay tax like any other company, but we do not distribute our profit. All the profits are used as reserve, business expansion, and charitable purposes. We call these businesses are registered as separate legal entities, include many, many things. Beauty parlors, clinic, hospitals, museums, restaurants, food and beverages, transport services, schools and universities. Uh, there's a, an NGO in Bangladesh, BRAC, and some of you may know about it. They run 32,000 schools. 32,000 schools. And they now have their own university. It's an NGO, but they do it as a social enterprise. They are the largest exporter of dairy products out of Bangladesh. Did you know that you've heard of the beer, um, what's the Danish beer called? Heineken. 
That's owned by, sorry, Carlsberg. Oh, you're a real drinker. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Carlsberg is owned by a foundation. Who, who knows? One day, Singapore Airlines might be owned by a, a, a social enterprise. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Printing, publishing, export, import ventures, tour companies, hotels, manufacturing, mobile telephone, banks, IT, and so on. Of all the Asian countries, Bangladesh is probably the most advanced. There are several reasons behind that. The government is not so active, and there are a lot of donors giving it. So that's why social enterprises are very, very effective. As, as far as the country that is the most advanced is Great Britain. It has about 320,000 social enterprises. And these social enterprises contribute 6.7% to the gross domestic product. It's gigantic, more than most industries in, in this part of Asia. So that, that is an example why it is being promoted because they want a lot of work being done by the non-government sector, but it also is sustainable. Don't have to keep on giving it money. So these are just some examples of the businesses that are of social enterprises. But none of them started off big. Not a lot of them started off small. Now, among a handful of these NGOs, there's a movement to help and secure uh, financial business security and what's being helped today is grossly inadequate. I'd like to see donors, companies, foundations give money to deserving causes, say, look, we will give you for you to help those people, but at the same time, we will give you money and help to train you to have a social enterprise so that one day you can help yourselves. That, I think, ought to be a message to all donors today, and I am very surprised why donors are somewhat dumb. Very surprising. They have money. Do you think intelligence and money goes together? Well, it doesn't. All right? We need to get this to all the donors of the world. Be realistic. Do you want us to stay under your tutelage? Is this a new form of neocolonialism? Or do you want us to be independent financially? If you do, then help us. That's what we need to do. All the businesses that give money to charitable causes ought to realize that we must help you to have your social enterprise so you can help yourself so we can get on with other causes too. Now that's a real message that the world has to understand and has to change. All these pseudo CSRs must go away. You know, they give you know, $50,000 a huge check out there in the newspapers to give and not to count the cost. What on earth is that? Now, here's a perfect picture just came out of my own country. Uh, helping people is fine, admirable. But the donors and the companies should also help to create social enterprises. I think this is a very, very important thing that we need to do. I hope all of us sitting in this room that are young social entrepreneurs realize that the only certain road out of financial inadequacy and even demise is through business enterprise. And one day, one day, these enterprises will have enough profits to help support itself and to help support other organizations, not only yourself. As I said, imagine if you're Social enterprise owned Singapore Airlines. If my social enterprise owned Thai International, that would be real trouble for them and for us. Now, these are the business enterprises that I started some time ago by this organization called the Population and Community Development Association, a Thai NGO. We're not the best. We've been doing it a long, long time. But you can see that it does work. My nonprofit organization began in 1974, before most of you were born. The first company, social enterprise, we started was in 1975. So one year after that, and we knew very well we could not expect to live off the generosity of others forever, so that's why we began. So 38 years ago we began that, because we knew. 
And the perfect example at the time was that we had the Vietnam War going on and America gave Thailand all sorts of things, even stuff we didn't want. <laughs> America does that quite often. <laughs> and we realized that when the Vietnam War was over, America packed its bag and went home, left. So I knew that you could not expect to live off the generosity of others forever. So we started the first social enterprise. Mm -hmm. Over the last 38 years, we've now got, had 26 going. And these activities, businesses, help to fund about 70% of all our work. Now, it's not 100, but it could have been 100 if the, the other donors stopped giving us money. It would be 100, but they like what we did. And they saw that we help ourselves, so they kept on giving for new things. So we never reached 100. And we don't mind not reaching 100 as long as we help ourselves. The volume went up every year, but the proportion stayed around there. Now, the assets that have been generated out of all this, it was not from the donors, but from here. It includes land, buildings, equipment, capital, for new companies, we only borrowed money once, and that was from the, for the first company. We borrowed $65,000, started it, and then we kept the reserve, and then the business expansions, and expanded into rural development centers, and all the other companies. So a, a lot of money, a lot of assets, all came from the social enterprise. The types of businesses we divided into two. One was what we call optimization of profit. We're working with somewhat underprivileged people. We don't try to make big profits from it. We just don't make a loss, a bit like a bonsai tree. It stays alive but doesn't grow. So there's no capital formation. You must realize it. If you're going to do it to, to, for, for optimization of profit, you can survive but you cannot expand. There's no capital formation. Whereas the second type is maximization of profit. You try to make profit. And the profits are used to do the things I mentioned, reserve, business expansion, and to fund charitable activities. So the first one is to help those that are somewhat underprivileged uh, in, in a system. Now, these, these are the things we do. We have uh, shops in many, many parts of the country. And some of the produce we sell uh, are made from the rural settings. But some we make ourselves. We have, for instance, a, a new set of T-shirts with the Olympic rings on it but made of condoms. And we call it the weapon of mass protection. <laughs> and many, many others. We have key rings. We have many, many key rings and says, don't leave home without it. And many other messages. We have mobile vans, which we rent out. Food and agricultural products, rice, biscuits, and so on and so forth. Red jasmine rice. Restaurants and catering. The most famous is the cabbages and condoms restaurant, where we say we advertise our food is guaranteed not to cause pregnancy. <laughs> uh, and, and after the meal, after the meal, you get given condoms. And during U.S. presidential election, which is coming up in America, we say, sorry, we have no mints. Please take a condom instead. And we say Republican size and Democrat size. <laughs> uh, and every night, every night, we have about 250 customers. Every night of the week, it's in every guidebook. We've never advertised. Not because they felt sorry for us, but you must remember that people will support you if, one, your product is good, the price is appropriate, and if the location is nice and atmosphere is good, and then finally, the cause. Don't expect them to support you because your cause is good. Consumers aren't like that. Therefore, the quality must be good, and we have to be as good as all the businesses. Don't think we can sit back and relax like diamond-fingered ladies. No, we have to work really hard and get it going. We have to be able to compete. That's what social enterprise is all about. All right, restaurants, catering. We have two in Japan. We have one in Oxford in England. And we hope one in Singapore pretty soon. And uh, we must order the condom separately because the condoms we have at the moment a Thai size and too small for Singapore. <laughs> but we'll, we'll go international size before we, we come here. 
and this is what, what it looks like. Uh, the cabbages and condoms, people come and take photos, they love it. We have Santa condom there, made of condoms, you see? And hanging everywhere. And we have training, local and international, healthcare. We provide uh, uh, x-ray for almost all university students at a very moderate price before they enter the university. And workers, we do about 60,000 immigrant workers in, in the border towns with x-rays and health examination. We small construction, we build small dams and small buildings, not more than four stories. Construction material we make. Factory real estate. We want to stop women migrating to Bangkok. So instead of taking people in machines, we said, why don't we bring machines to people? So we built these things, but not as factories. We built them first as chicken pens, duck pens, and fish pens for training. And then when the funding from Canada and Germany went after 10 years, we turned them into factories to make shoes and ice skates and braziers and all sorts of stuff. So it went from feather to leather. <laughs> Manufacturing. We even introduced the concept of social uh, 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 um, capitalism, whereby 40% of the equity is owned by the workers, and 30% by the company, and th another 30% by us. We want the workers to share being a capitalist. And then we have a company called Business for Rural Education and Development. It sells rice and many other things, and the purpose is to support education. So this company is very specific. It supports education. And also ecotourism, hotels, resorts. This one's by Pattaya. You've probably heard of Pattaya by the sea. This is it. Next to Yacht Club. Clean water. And this is a resort called Birds and Bees and the restaurant Cabbages and Condoms that help to fund schools. Because the owner says, I have enough rice to eat already. Why should I need any more rice in the house? Let's do something fun and exciting. And education was what the owner decided to do with it. And that's what it looks like. It's green, it's like a jungle, and even has photovoltaics on the roof for electricity. Right by the sea. And this is the children's play pool, uh, uh, flower walk, tunnel, and we make our own rainbow. We spray water for the, for the pots. These are toilet rings, septic tanks, but we paint them to make it attractive. Who says it can't be attractive? Uh, and then we spray it with water, it's growing vegetables, and then every morning at 8.30 and afternoon at 4.30, you get the rainbow. So we make our own rainbow. And then this is a restaurant at night, very, very popular. And of course, the profits helped to build school and run school, and it helped to establish a second social enterprise called Bread. And Bread is business for rural education and development. So in year six, Bread will support the bamboo school. And birds and bees can support another venture or another school. It's just like having another baby. Now, at this place, at the resort, is what I call 3-in-1. It is a resort called Birds and Bees. It also has a school, the Bamboo School, right there itself. And it also has a rural development foundation, all out of one. And during low season, 40% of the staff are sent out to do rural development work amongst the schools. Because every hotel has low season in most countries. Why don't we train them to go out and help other people? They feel good about it also. Now, today, we're helping to establish social enterprises for other organizations and training youth to become future social entrepreneurs. And I'm delighted to see that this is happening through the Singapore International Foundation. I hope that more and more and more is done. And here's one in the school itself. Now, it's not only out of school, it's in school. We have three companies, Bread, Butter, and Biscuit. This one is Biscuit. It's, uh, it's for the students itself. And they must learn how to do business. They borrow the money. Very simple reason. 
70% of those who finish education in most developing countries, including Thailand, are self-employed. There are no employers for them. But we don't train them at all while in school how to do business. So we do it. And we have a loan fund for them to do this. This is the students of the Bamboo School. Now this is an example. We stopped giving scholarship outside for the secondary school. These are two 13-year-old girls. We said, we'll give you a new type of scholarship. You go to the market and decide what business you want to do for two hours after school. And they selected uh, uh, um, sausages, grilled sausages. And so they were trained. They had to select their own trainer in the market. And then they did it after school. And they earned good money. As it turned out, don't worry about how much, but it was five times higher than the scholarship they got by doing only two hours. Now, what happened? The old system was good. You got a scholarship. Wonderful. But this one, you get business skills as well as education. And so that the business skills will stay with them forever while the scholarship gets them through education. Now, the other thing that's interesting, now they know all about it. They have their grandparents selling it all day. So the grandparents are making good money, their parents are good in making good money, but it came from the daughters. Right? That's just an example for you to see. So that's another way of doing it. Start young. We're also helping schools. We call this the school bird, school-based integrated rural development. We go to the poor families through the school, starting off with the parents of, of yeah, children in the school who are poor, and then those families that need help. So to become business people as well. And they earn some money out of this. But this is probably the most interesting one. And I think the Singaporean uh, uh, group could also learn. This, we call this a social enterprise mini farm. It will earn a net profit of $12,000 US a year and using only 1,600 square meters, 40 by 40. It's probably a little bit bigger than this room. I don't know how, how big this room is. Maybe 24? So it's 40 by 40. That's all you need. And you, you, you'll notice that it's grown on stones and rocks. We don't need soil. Don't have to own your own land. Grow them in, in bags. And these are recycled plastic bags. And you can do a lot also here. So as you need a little bit of space. You can have the runway to do it at the airport if you like unused runways, and then you can have uh, uh, bags with vegetables. Now, I want to show you the steps that, that, that this has been moved on, right towards the end of the session now. And this is part of the one we might call it God's little acre, if you like, but this is a social enterprise farm. And you see these bags, these are uh, recycled bags, and each one can hold one cantaloupe plant. You can see it on the right being grown in a, a, a sort of fairly green. And each row is only about 40 centimeters and 25 meters long. And each one has 200 bags, and each one will have uh, a cantaloupe that will earn an, at least a US dollar. So it comes to $200 per row. And you can do this four times a year for each row. You multiply that, huge amount of money. So just a little space. But imagine you have 10 rows of these three. You can do this in Singapore very, very easily. Just need to find some lousy land somewhere. And now the cantaloupe on the right is one month old. The fruits come out. Only need two months. And on the left, it's not yet done. And that's what the cantaloupe looks like. And there are many, many types of colors. Very, very good income. If you do this, all the hotels would do it, because Singapore has to import these already. You don't need a big building to do it. And now we also do mushroom, but using retired beach umbrellas. You've got a lot of hotels with swimming pools. They've got lots of umbrellas. Go and ask them for it, right? And um, you see how colorful it is? And you see the, the, the umbrella at the top? And that's all part of the... 40 meters by 40 meters. And this is inside the mushroom. You have at least 500 bags, and it also earns good money. All of this combined comes to 
profit of 12,000, say $1,000 a month, net profit after deducting of all costs, including your own salary. And come over and take a look. That's what it looks like on the inside. And now out of season lime. Lime is most expensive in March, April, and May. We can manipulate manipulate it so it comes out in March, April, and May. You make good money. It's worth 10 times higher than the other season. I, I won't tell you how to do it yet, but you can come and take a look. It, no, no, no I, I, I'm, I'm just not going to take up too much of your time. But if you want to privately, I'll do that for you. Uh, this is the line. Now, you'll notice we grow them in pots because we have to stop them from going out for water at a certain time of the year. We cover it for 20 days. It's nearly dead. Then you release it, give it water. It's so delighted. It didn't die. It has so many flowers and so many fruits. All right? Now, in the beginning, that's the way we do it, just by itself. And now we've advanced bit by bit by bit, become less and less ignorant. So in the beginning, it was just on its own. Now we started by putting some of these vegetable bags with the lime. We got a little bit smarter, got even more in it. A bit smarter still, even on the outside now. Even a bit more. More. And today, I'll tell you how many. Doesn't it look nice? That's two and a half. Square meters, that's all. But a bit smaller than that table square. And you can do it. The equivalent of 700 uh, 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 vegetable plants in one year, just that space. And this is how much there is in it. In a ring, six bags. Next ring, 14 bags. Next ring, 22 bags. Next ring, 24 bags, and the last one, 34 bags. 100 altogether. And you can grow it seven times a year, so that's equivalent to 700 bags. And what you get out of it is uh, 2,000 baht in dollars is at 60 something dollars, almost 70 dollars. Okay? So, bit by bit by bit, and you can do this in Singapore and anywhere. As a start, I call this the kindergarten social enterprise. Sometimes you don't know what to do. Start off doing this. Get involved. Earn money. And then move on to something else as you like. You go from this kindergarten to some fancy primary school if you like. Now, this, this is the whole point. The most difficult part of, for social entrepreneurs is to start a business. And I think this is one way of, of doing it. And then we also now have expanded to include fish, frogs, crickets. Frogs are very good and crickets are also delicious. Very high protein. And some American said to me, oh, Michai, you're raising uh, 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 cockroaches. I said, no, no, these are crickets, not cockroaches. <laughs> but different. And then finally, when you have a fence, why don't you grow something on your fence? It's only 20 centimeters with posts, and then you put plastic bags or, or, or containers and grow vegetables. Mm -hmm. So that social enterprise doesn't only mean doing it the modern way. We can do it the traditional way, and at the same time, sort of be imaginative about it. So if you're interested, I'd be happy to help. If you don't have a social enterprise yet, start off doing something simple like this, makes money, and there is a real market. Uh, I can guarantee you the lime, all the lime in Singapore is imported, and bean sprouts also. So all these things, there is a market already. Go to the companies, the, the hotels, and say, would you like to buy some absolutely wonderful product? All right? So my message, final one, is to the donors that if you want to help provide some basic needs on a sustainable basis, please help start a social enterprise and train young social entrepreneurs. This machine must be made in Thailand. <laughs> and that is a website that you can go to that explains how to get a business for social progress or social enterprise going. And I think I've used up my time. I want to thank you, and I wish you all the very best for your endeavor, and be realistic about it, and enjoy it for the rest of your life. Thank you.